Well, this evening we're going to finish off that um, text we were looking at this morning in John chapter 16. And rather than reading from verse 16 of John 16, I'm going to begin in verse 23 since it begins with our theme this evening, which has to do with prayer. So what I'd like to do is read John 16, verses 23 through 33. Jesus says, in that day you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. These things I have spoken to you in figurative language, and hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father, in that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me, and have believed that I came forth from the Father. I came forth from the Father, and have come into the world I am leaving the world again and going to the Father. His disciples said, Lo, now you are speaking plainly and are not using a figure of speech. Now we know that, you, uh, now that we, excuse me, now we know that you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you. By this we believe that you have come from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered each to his own home and to leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. Again, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. Now, this morning, we again were reflecting back over the past several Lord's Day sermons on uh, the Gospel of John, particularly the Upper Room Discourse. Uh, to remind ourselves of the different things that the Lord has done, that Jesus has done, to give us joy. And it's not just one thing, but it's many things. Uh, he has, as He said, prepared a place for us in heaven, and He is going to come and receive us again into a world, a perfect world, of love and holiness. And obviously, that should give us joy. He has given to us His Spirit to show us that we really do belong to God, the spirit of adoption, who bears, you know, testimony, bears witness to our spirits that we really are His children. He has given us His spirit to give us the power to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, even as Jesus served His Father, to experience His love as Jesus experienced His Father's love, and of course, to help us in the work He's given to us in bringing the gospel to others by restraining the world and convicting them of the truth. And obviously, if, if that's something we really desire to do, which we will by the Holy Spirit, we'll be, have joy in the fact that the Spirit of God is working with us to help us to do that. Jesus has also given to us a settled peace of knowing that everything that He says is true, that our sins really are forgiven, that we're not really giving our lives to a fool's errand. I mean, sometimes we are tempted to think that these things aren't true. That is when our grace is low and our flesh, the strength of our flesh is high, when the world is pressing in on us, sometimes we're tempted to think this. But we know that isn't the case. We know that we are giving ourselves to something that is real, that is true. Jesus has settled that in our minds. He's given to us peace in knowing that everything He has said is true, and He has given us every reason to be courageous in the face of a world that He said would hate us and be hostile to us because He has overcome the world by the blood of His cross. Now, there are going to be difficulties, of course, things to be concerned about within ourselves and within the world, things that will bring us grief, but Jesus has given us a joy that the world cannot take away, a joy that will last forever. Now, that's what we were looking at this morning, this evening. I do want us to look at the second thing that Jesus gave us in this text, the second reason that we might have joy, and that is the promise of answered prayer. But again, 
Jesus has been telling, this through, telling us this throughout this, uh, this section, throughout this, uh, these, these final words that he's giving to his disciples, but now he gives it to us with a little bit of a new twist. Jesus is directing his disciples to a change that is about to take place since he was leaving to go to the Father. Since that was true, he's saying they would no longer come to him for the things that they needed. Rather, they would go to the Father, and they would go to Him in His name. Now that, of course, is the situation we find ourselves in. This is what we are also now to do, that we might receive the things that we need so that in the process, as we receive what we ask for, and especially as we ask for those things that the Lord would have us to have, the things that we need to glorify Him, that our joy might be full. Now, first of all, Jesus tells us that we may now ask the Father directly for anything that we want, He says. He says in verse 23, truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, He will give it to you. Now, what we need to do is kind of come to grips here with what the difference is in what Jesus is saying. Now, it may sound a little bit strange that Jesus had just earlier told them something differently than what He is telling them now. Earlier, Jesus said that they could come to Him and ask Him for whatever they wanted, and He would do it for them. You know, we, we're, I don't know if this solves the question, but it does seem to um, uh, perhaps give us a little more food for thought. Uh, exactly who are we to ask for what we need and, and how are we to go about this? Are we to pray to the Father, pray to the Son, pray to the Holy Spirit, we pray to all three of them, and so forth? Well, Jesus earlier told His disciples this in John 14, verses 13 and 14. Whatever you ask in My name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask Me anything in My name, I will do it. Well, the question is settled. Let's go to Jesus. Let's ask Him. But now Jesus is telling us that instead of asking Him, we should go to the Father directly and ask Him. You know, it is interesting to add a little bit more to the subject. Even earlier in Jesus' ministry, Jesus was directing them. He was teaching them, teaching us, as we understand, to go to the Father in prayer. I mean, consider what the Lord tells us to do in the Lord's Prayer. And I'll just simply read it in Matthew 6, verses 7 through 13. Backing up just a little bit into why He gives them the Lord's Prayer, He says this to His disciples, and when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetitions as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now, Jesus had earlier taught His disciples to pray to the Father, and so now He's telling them to do this again, but what is it that has changed? Well, really, the only thing that seems to have changed is the fact that now when we pray to the Father, we are to pray in His name. Notice what He says in verse 24, until now you have asked for nothing in My name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. There's a transition that's taking place right here. Jesus is about to complete His work. He has told them He's about to go to the Father. When He goes to the Father, He will be, as we know from Scripture, crowned with all power and all glory. He will sit at the right hand of God. He will take up the rule over all creation. He will basically begin His work as mediator. Now, once that has happened, He's no longer then going to be on the earth, but He's going to be in heaven. 
And so the disciples would no longer be asking Him, coming to Him to do the things for them that they need, but they would then direct their prayers to the Father. And again, notice that the, if, if you recall just what we saw from the Lord's Prayer, what the, the reason was or the basis upon which Jesus taught them to pray at that time, that they would no longer basically plead for yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory as the reasons why the Lord should answer these prayers. But now they would pray pleading the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They would come in His name on the basis of the merits of God's Son, which is again why Jesus says, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, He will give it to you. Now, this appears to be the way that Jesus would now have us ask for the things that we need, that we are to direct our prayers to the Father in the name or on the basis of what Jesus has done, on the basis of His merits. We are not to come in any other way, basically. We are certainly not to come in our own name, but only in His name. And He says, you, we can ask basically for anything. We can ask for what we want. We can ask for what we need, and He will give it to us so that our joy may be made full. Now, we will need to modify that just a bit. Again, we'll come back to that in a few moments in, in the last section, the last point. So Jesus tells us now to direct our prayers to the Father in His name. We can ask what we want. He will give those things to us. But now... Jesus gives us another interesting reason, not a new reason, but one that I think is worth reflecting on, why we can ask the Father directly, why we should come to the Father, and that we don't, as it were, need to ask Jesus to ask the Father on our behalf. And this is a very encouraging reason. It's because the Father Himself loves us. Let's look at verses 25 through 27. He says, these things I have spoken to you in figurative language. An hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. In that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will request of the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. Now, Jesus isn't telling us here that we don't need to come in His name, that we can just go directly to the Father and bypass Jesus, but He is telling us that we don't have to ask Jesus to ask the Father. We can go directly to the Father in the name of the Son because the Father loves us. Now that Jesus' work basically is, is going to be complete, now that we have been forgiven of our sins and reconciled to the Father through the Son, now that we have His righteousness given to us, we actually are an object of the Father's love. We are lovely to Him. Jesus says we don't need to go to Him so that He can go to the Father. We can actually go straight to Him because He loves us. Now, how can we know that the Father loves us? I mean, how do, we, how do we know? Is it just kind of a warm and fuzzy feeling? Do we read in the, in the text, you know, the Father loves us, therefore uh, it's true? Well, Jesus does give us a bit of a reason here why the Father loves us and how we can know that He loves us. Notice what He says in verse 27. For the Father Himself loves you because you have loved Me and have believed that I came forth from the Father. Now, this is how we can know that the Father loves us. This is how we can know that we can go directly to the Father in prayer and that He will hear us when we come in the name of Jesus because we love Jesus and because we have believed in Him. Now, we need to think about that for a little bit. If you believe that Jesus came from the Father, that He is everything that He says He is, that He is the Son of God, that He is the Christ, that He is the Savior of the world. If you have trusted Him to save you, then you can know the Father loves you. You can know that you can go to Him. But He also says this, something else that must be true of you. You must love Him. Okay, Jesus must be the center of your heart. Jesus must be first in your affections. 
Now, how do you know that Jesus is first in your affections? How do you know that you love Jesus? Well, we've already seen what Jesus has told us, that this will show in the way that you live. You will put Him first in your life. Remember what Jesus said earlier, if you love me, and in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Our love for Jesus makes a difference in the way that we live. We will obey Him. Again, we will keep His commandments. Now, how many of His commandments will we keep? All of them. When will we keep them? Just sometimes and sometimes not? No, we will do it all the time. Will we ever fail to keep these commandments? Of course we'll fail. The Lord tells us that we'll fail. We're not perfect. We're far from perfect. But we're not going to count on failing. We're not going to plan to fail. We're not going to make room in our lives for failure and for sin. But we're going to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision in our, in our lives for the flesh. We will do our best to obey Him because we love Him. And because that is what the one whom we love wants us to do. So we can know the Father loves us if we love the Son, if we believe in the Son. Now, does Jesus mean to tell us here, because this, this can get us into a little bit of a sticky wicket. Does Jesus mean to say here that the Father's love for us depends on our love for Jesus and our trusting Jesus in the first place? I mean, that, that's a question that kind of separates the church a little bit. Well, the answer to that is yes and no. The Father is not going to love us and grant us this blessing of direct access to Him. Unless we first love and trust in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to meet these conditions. When we're outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, God loves us, the Father loves us, but not in the way that we that we might think or that a majority of Christians might think. He doesn't love us for what we are. He doesn't see any beauty in us. He loves us with what, well, we would, we would call, I'm not sure the word is actually used in Scripture, but the idea is there. He loves us with a love of benevolence, which means that He shows kindness and mercy to all of His creatures. I mean, remember what Jesus says, that we are to love our enemies because even our Heavenly Father uh, is kind to those, to the wicked. He causes His sun to shine on both and His rain to fall on both. If you read Psalm 104, it talks about His common mercies and grace. Uh, yes, God shows love to the whole world. As a matter of fact, Jesus tells us God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. So the Father does love us in a certain way when we're outside of Christ, but when we are in Christ, He loves us in a different way. He actually loves what He sees. He loves us with what we call love of complacence because we're in Christ and Christ is in us and He's being formed in us and we're becoming more like Him. There's actually something that is lovely in us and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, was it our love for Him and our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that put us in Him? Is that something that we did, something we were able to do by our own strength, as is commonly believed by a majority of Christian churches today? No, it was God's love that gave rise to our love. It was His mercy. He first loved us. That's what John writes in 1 John 4.19. We love we love with the kind of love that, that is a supernatural love, which is a spirit-produced uh, love because He first loved us. It's not that we love because we first loved Him, or He loved us because we first loved Him, or we loved the Son and trusted in the Son because we were able to do that, and then the Father loved us. No, He loved us first, and that's why we now love. It was His grace that actually gave rise to the faith that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. That is, the faith is a gift of God, and certainly the salvation that that faith brings that, that connects us to the Lord Jesus Christ is a gift from God. It is not as a result of works, 
so that no one may boast. When you consider what the Bible says about our condition coming into the world, that we're dead in trespass and sin, that we're the enemies of God and we can't submit to His will, it's obvious that faith must come from God, that love for God must come from God. It's not going to come from us. So our love and our faith is not what moved Him to love us, but rather it's the evidence that He loved us first in eternity and sent His Son for us so that His Son might send His Spirit into our hearts to change our hearts so that we might love Him and put our trust in Him. So when we love Jesus and when we believe in Jesus, that tells us that the Father loves us. That's the evidence that He loves us, not only now because we are loving Him and, and trusting Him, but that He has loved us from all eternity and He sent His Son for us. And it's also what tells us that we can go directly to the Father because He loves us in the name of His Son in order to ask for what it is that we want. Now, I read all the way to the end of the text because I, I do want us to see that this promise that Jesus is giving us that we can come to the Father and ask for whatever we want is also meant to be to us a source of joy, a source of peace, and a source of courage, even as um, uh, we saw this morning with regard to um, what the Lord has promised and how those things will, will bring these blessings to the disciples, certainly the promise of answered prayer will do that. Now, when Jesus tells us that we can go to the Father in prayer in His name, we do need to understand that He does mean it to grant to us all these blessings, but we also need to understand that uh, He isn't giving us in this promise a blank check to ask for whatever we want, at least in a certain sense. I mean, it is and it isn't. There's a lot of questions in Scripture that are answered by yes and no. It's not all one way or the other. We do know that promises like this, verses like this, have been misused by the health and wealth movement in particular for years. And having come through that movement years ago, I got to experience that firsthand. On the other hand, it is a blank check to ask the Father for whatever we want if our heart is right before the Lord. Now, if you love and trust Jesus, there's nothing that you will want other than this one thing, to give Him glory and to glorify His Father because you love Him, because He is the center of your affections. That is what you will want. And everything else you do in this world, everything else you desire is all going to be tied to that one thing. I mean, Paul told us on one occasion that even in the things we eat and drink, we should, all, we should do it all to the glory of God. In the context, he was talking about things offered to you know, idols and so forth. But the principle, you know, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. So if we, if we love the Lord Jesus Christ, if, if we believe in Him, this is our heart. These are the things that we're going to want. And so when we ask Him for these things, He will give them to us. When you ask for the things that are going to help you better glorify the Father and the Son, and then the Lord gives those things to you so that you're able to do it, this is going to bring you joy. Jesus says, ask and you will receive so that your joy may be made full. And your joy will be full because this is what you want. This is what you want more than anything else in the world, to give Him glory and to see Him honored. And that's because you love Him. You love the Father and you love the Son and you want them to be honored. So yes, you may ask and the Lord will give you those things and it will bring you joy because you are now able better to honor the one whom you love most of all. But Jesus also said, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. You see, this promise of prayer can also give you peace and I think with all the things that we have in the world to be anxious about and be concerned about, uh, we need a promise like this. We need peace. Think about what the Lord says through Paul. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, and see how prayer uh, will bring peace. He says, be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. 
but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. You can go to the Father. You can ask Him for whatever you need, and He will give it to you. Are you anxious? Are you worried about anything? Uh, The Lord tells us we can take those worries to Him. Jesus says we can take them to the Father. We can ask for His help in the name of His Son, and He will give us peace. Even in the middle of situations that look like, you know, everything's going to come, as it were, un- unwound, unglued. Everything's going to fall apart. It seems like your world is falling apart. So much burden, so much care, so much concern, so many things to be worried about. We can bring these things to the Lord, thanking Him for all that He has done for us, and He will give us a peace that we don't even understand. How can I, how can I have peace in the middle of all this difficulty that I'm faced with, and yet it's there? Because the Lord is faithful to His promise. He will give you peace. And then Jesus said, these things I have spoken to you, that you may have peace, and that also that you may have courage. In the world you're going to have tribulation, but He says, be of good cheer or be courageous because I have overcome the world. Now, courage comes from faith, I believe. Faith that Jesus actually has overcome the world in the way that He said that He has. But how can we appropriate that? How can we experience that courage that comes knowing that Jesus has done this? Well, we need a stronger faith. But how do we get a stronger faith? Well, we can pray and we can ask the Father in the name of the Son and He will give it to us. Now, one thing I I just want to mention in this regard is that when you ask Him for things like this, you just need to be aware... (laughs) that the way the Lord answers these prayers for greater faith is usually by making us face situations where we're going to have to face our fears. In other words, instead of, you know, the Lord just simply zapping you with courage, He's going to put you in a situation where you're going to have to learn to trust Him, and He will give you the courage when you actually step up in faith and try to do what it is you're afraid of doing. That's the way the Lord typically stretches our faith and exercises us and helps us to grow. He makes us face what we're afraid of. And sometimes it works the same way with regard to sin, doesn't it? There's a particular sin you're struggling with. You say, Lord, would you, would you please give me the grace to overcome this sin? He usually turns up the temptation, as it were. I mean, he, he, he is the one who allows the enemy to tempt us, but he does it for our good. And He might try us so that we will learn to be stronger against it. Uh, That, I believe, is true from Scripture as well. So just be aware when you're asking the Lord for certain things, He will answer those prayers in a way perhaps you're not exactly expecting. You need to be prepared for that. Uh, And remember that when the Lord does bring particular trials, when He does bring these things to stretch us, to refine us, and to strengthen us, whatever it may be, it's always going to be for good, and it's going to have the, the purpose or the end for which He actually brought them. So what I want us to take away from this is to be encouraged to ask the Lord for the things we need to ask Him for the things we desire, to ask Him for great things, you know, things that, that He's done in the past and even greater things that we might see Him do great things. If we really desire His glory, if we really want Him to be honored and His Son to be honored, we, we need to ask for those things. That is the way that the Lord said He will actually bring them about. And as we see the answers to these prayers, and we should expect that the Lord is going to answer these prayers because He has told us that He will do that, we will have a joy that is full as He promised. I just want to leave you with this encouraging uh, passage from the Apostle Paul. Uh, He does write to the Ephesians in Ephesians 3, verses 20 and 21. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we can ask or think, according to the power that works within us. 
To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That He is able to do it. We realize that He is able. Our, I think our biggest question comes is, is He willing? Well, Jesus tells us that He is willing. He says we can ask for anything and He will give it to us. Ask, He says, and you will receive that your joy may be made full. Ask for great things and expect that He will grant great things. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us appropriate this promise.